really all started for me with uh, Woody Guthrie. My dad had Woody Guthrie uh, records like, uh, I've been doing some hard traveling, I thought you know it. I've been doing some hard. And uh, I used to listen to this album, this box set, Smithsonian Folkways. It was a compendium of folk music. And that really got me into music, into guitar, into listening to the radio. And uh, when I first started listening to the radio, there was no FM radio because I'm that old. It was all AM radio. It was all listening to soul classes like... I'm going to wait till the midnight hour. Although it wasn't always the Wilson Pickett version. Sometimes it was the Rascals version. But I listened to AM radio, and that was interesting. But when FM radio started in the late 60s, I used to stay, stay up really late in high school and listen to the New York FM progressive rock station, which at the time was WNEW 102.7 on your FM dial. And they had really kind of spacey FM DJs. There was this woman that came on at 10 p.m. at night, and she would start her show out with uh, some electronic music. Sometimes it was uh, The Endless Enigma by Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and there'd be this weird electronic music, and then she'd recite some poetry, and then she'd say, come fly with me, Alison Bird. No, she'd say, come fly with me, Alison Steele, the night bird. And uh, that was part of my uh, FM experience. Uh, also, when I was 16, somehow my friend Jeffrey and I convinced our parents that we would look at colleges by taking a bus up to Burlington, Vermont from New York City, and then hitchhiking all the way back to New York, stopping at colleges. And one of the first colleges we stopped at was a place called Middlebury College in uh, Vermont. And we had a family friend there that took care of us, put us up in a, a girl's dormitory, which I remember vividly. But at 3 o'clock in the morning one night, she said, my friend Roger is doing a radio show. We should go see him. And that was my first experience ever in 1971 in a radio studio, 3 o'clock in the morning, this guy with long blonde hair doing a classic FM college radio show and it was fascinating to me. So seeing that and listening to radio when I was in high school, uh, that's how I got interested in doing radio. My first college radio air shift was at Colgate University, WRCU 90.1 FM. I think it was 10 watts, so it went about 20, 30 feet into the campus. And uh, gosh, I, w I wish I remembered what was the first song I played. But it was in a summer. We, have to, we used to have to do summer semesters. They wanted to keep the college open all year round. So in the summer, most of the students were gone. And two of my deadbeat friends, uh, Rich and uh, Tom, were running the station that summer because all the upperclassmen had gone home. And they just talked their friends into doing air shifts. And they asked me if I'd do one. I said, yeah. And that's where it all started. But my first commercial paid radio show was in Albany, New York at WQBK-FM. And I do remember the first song I played. I went on the air 6 a.m., uh, 1977, January 20th. Uh, it was 20 below zero. I, I think that was the air temperature. You might want to look it up. But there was a cold snap in upstate New York. And a cold snap in upstate New York is a cold snap. And I went in there, and I had a little bit of a fever that might have been nervous tension. And the first song I played was uh, first song, side two, Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, Within You and without you, because I've always felt that life flows, in, life flows within you, but most of all, without you. The first album I bought that wasn't something really obvious, like, you know, all the Beatles albums and stuff like that. In those days, we'd also be buying 45s at the local Woolworths, you know, like Buffalo Springfield singles and uh, R&B singles. But the first really important album I remember buying is Jeff Beck Truth, the very first Jeff Beck album. And that's when he had hired an unknown singer named Rod Stewart to be his vocalist. And it was one of the all-time super groups before anybody knew how super they were. Because it was Jeff Beck on guitar. It was Ronnie Wood, later to become a member of the Rolling Stones and a member of the Faces, on bass, and a guy named Mickey Waller on drums. And a lot of it was inspired by Chicago blues long before I knew anything, really, about Chicago blues. And I remember going to a store 
in those days, as I pointed out, you get records at Woolworths, you get them at record stores, they had record stores, but you could also go to a music store where they sold pianos and saxophones, and they would have record bins there. And I remember going down to uh, some music store in Queens Boulevard in Queens, New York, and buying Jeff Beck Truth. That's a great question because, as people in radio know, I've been receiving press copies or promotional copies of records and CDs and downloads for 40 years now. So I really got to work at buying albums, finding albums I haven't already received for free. But very often if I go to a show and I see a new unknown artist, I'll uh, go in the back to the merchandise table and buy a, buy a CD or an album. But the last album I bought was a download by a Chicago artist. It's a guy named James Elkington. And he's played with 11th Dream Day. I see him walk out on stage with a variety of bands. I go, oh my god, there's James Elkington. And uh, he has a new album. It's actually a solo debut, although he's been on dozens and dozens of records. And it is an acoustic guitar picking singer-songwriter masterpiece. I'm not sure I even know how to uh, pronounce the name of the album. I think it's called Wintress Woma. I was trying to find it on the internet. What the heck does that mean, James? But it harkens back to a time of uh, the late 60s, early 70s, where there are all these British musicians, kind of uh, alternative folk musicians, like John and Beverly Martin and uh, John Renborn, and artists like Richard Thompson, who was playing with Fairport Convention, and a little bit later on, Nick Drake. And this album really reminds me of Nick Drake, really finely wrought lyrics, and just mind-blowing uh, acoustic guitar picking. James Elkington, Chicago guy. Everybody should own uh, Bob Dylan, Bringing It All Back Home, which has maybe the greatest B-side of an album that I can think of. Um, it includes It's All Right Ma, it includes Gates of Eden, which has one of the most impressionistic opening lyrics I've ever heard. Listen to this. Of war and peace, the truth just drifts. It's curfew gull, it glides. When you're a teenager listening to those lyrics, you're going, I'm not sure where he's coming from, but that's where I'm going. Uh, I also am a longtime devotee of the Rolling Stones. So the double album, Exile on Main Street, has always been a desert island disc for me. Let me break that question up into three parts. First big concert I went to, my parents took me to Woolman Skating Rink in Central Park in New York, with my brothers too, who were such a pain in the neck when they were that little. And we saw Arlo Guthrie singing uh, stuff like, I don't want a pickle, just want to ride on my motorcycle. And that made a big impression on me. Uh, it was around the time that he had uh, released and recorded Alice's Restaurant, which has become a WXRT tradition on Thanksgiving Day, something you can look forward to. Uh, the 20 minute folk opus from Arlo Guthrie, which is, let me just warn people, a protest song. Uh, now, the first concert I went to with a buddy where we took the subway and went to an iconic um, concert hall, was to see uh, Grand Funk Railroad in 1970. Sitting here lonely like a, a broken man, where we saw them do Inside Looking Out. A uh, very early tour from Grand Funk Railroad, but they were the headline at the Fillmore East in New York City. I went with my friend Mario, who was in the famous band we had back in the um, late 60s, the Roundabouts. He and I were the two guitarists. And I remember being scandalized because I smelled marijuana smoke in the concert hall. And I need not point out to you that it's against the law. But it was not only one of the, I mean, the, the first big concert I went to with a buddy, it was indescribably loud and Mark Farner came out shirtless with bands around his massive biceps, and it was a trio, and we thought it was awesome. The first concert that 
would qualify as one of the great concerts in history would be at the Forest Hills Tennis Stadium in 1971. I went to see The Who, and they were touring after the, le the release of Who's Next. So the first time I ever heard Won't Get Fooled Again was not on a record because it wasn't out yet. It was live on a stage. In 1986, I went to St. Louis for the birthday of Chuck Berry, and it was a big birthday concert. It got turned into the movie Hail, Hail, Rock and Roll, and the concert was directed and produced by Keith Richards. And we went to the concert, and part of the story is it was a horrible concert because it was being filmed by Taylor Hackford uh, to be turned into this documentary movie about Chuck Berry and about this concert. And he kept coming out and stopping songs in the middle of them to recut them because he's making a movie. So for the concert goer, it was horrible. Now, if you look at the movie, you go, what a great show. But that has nothing to do with the encounter. What happened was we went back to the hotel. I was with some colleagues from WXRT who will remain nameless for obvious reasons. And uh, we stayed up very late, and I think we were drinking whiskey. It could have been anything. And about 2 in the morning or something, I said, guys, I, I just have to go for a little walk. And I went out in the hall, and I walked down the hall, and I came to the elevator banks, and Eric Clapton was standing there at the elevator. And I wanted to be cool. I didn't want to, like, scare him or anything. So I remember vividly that I went like this, because it was Eric Clapton in the elevator bank. And he starts pressing the elevators because he wants to get the hell out of there, because he can tell I'm a drunk fan. And I say to myself, don't say anything stupid, don't say anything stupid, don't say anything stupid. And I, I say to him, uh, what kind of guitar were you playing? Which is a phenomenally stupid question, because if you've ever watched anybody in concert, they play about 19 guitars. But he was very polite, and he started going off, well, mostly I played a Gibson SG. And it didn't matter. I wouldn't have recognized the guitar no matter what it was. I was just trying to make conversation. And at that point, the elevator came. He got in, went down. I walked back to the hotel room. I told my friends, hey, I just saw Eric Clapton at the elevator bank. And of course, they looked at me and said, you didn't see Eric Clapton. Get out of here, you idiot. It wasn't Eric Clapton. Why are you telling us stories? I go, no, it was Eric Clapton. They dismiss me. They don't believe me. I'm sitting there another half hour. We're having some beers. And I go, guys, i got to get up and just take a walk around. I'm getting dizzy. Uh, it's really late. So I go back out in the hall. And coming down the hall, I see these two guys. And they're walking kind of fast. And one guy has a headband. And he's carrying a bottle of Jack Daniels. And at this point, I am so so much lacking inhibition that I walk up to Keith Richards, who is the guy in the bandana with the Jack Daniels, and I lockstep with the both of them, and I say in a hurried voice, hey, listen, you just got to do me one favor. You got to do me one favor. You see that door down there, the door that's open, the hotel door that's open? You just have to do one thing. You just got to do one thing for me. Just walk in and walk out. All you got to do is walk in and walk out. You just got to walk in that room and walk out. Just walk in and walk out. That's all you got to do. Some guys in there might lose it. So he doesn't say anything to me, and he keeps walking, and he kicks open the door to the hotel room where my friends are, and he walks in the middle of the room. He goes, don't lose it. Turns around, walks out. I walk in the hotel room and say, I guess I didn't see Keith Richards. That's my most memorable encounter with a celebrity. Well, it's no secret to anybody that I am deeply in love with Emmy Lou Harris for her music, her charm, her knowledge of Major League Baseball. I would definitely put her on the list. Uh, perhaps for my wife, because she'd enjoy going, uh, Brian Ferry, although I've already done the Brian Ferry dinner. He's like the James Bond of rock and roll. He's just so elegant and suave, and uh, he knows good wine. And then who would be the last person I'd want to have uh, dinner with? Um, maybe Bono, because Bono's the sort of guy that when you interview him or you meet him, he's engaging. He always acts like he's known you his whole life, and he has a certain charm that would come across very nicely to have dinner with him. Plus, he's done some stuff. He has some stories. He's an interesting guy. 
My absolute favorite thing to do when I'm off the air is to play catch with my son out in front of our house, hardball. Um, although, you know, over the years he's gotten bigger and stronger, and now it's a little more of a challenge when he goes like this to tell me he's going to throw a curveball and I have to set myself a little bit better. But I have so many things I like to do off the air. I like to go to baseball games. I like to go to the north side, the south side. If I'm riding a bicycle, I'll stop to watch a little league game because I'm that kind of baseball fan. And uh, when I get the chance, I love to go sailing out on Lake Michigan. I grew up uh, with a sunfish, a little tiny sailboat. So I know how to sail, and in the intervening years, I've been on bigger sailboats. So occasionally a friend here or there has a sailboat will take me out there. And there's something about that moment when you get the sails up and you turn the engine off, and it's nothing but the sound of the wind that is one of the greatest moments you can have. The best thing about Chicago, I would say the best thing about Chicago the Chicago theater scene is unparalleled. It is also chosen by Bon Appetit magazine as the best culinary city in the country. I love dining out in Chicago, whether it's casual or it's fancy, whether it's you know an Italian beef with hot peppers or it's a 12-course menu at uh, Acadia. I love the culinary scene here. And of course, the biggest thing is the music from the Chicago blues, from going to Buddy Guy's Legends, to seeing all the artists that choose Chicago as one of their main stops on their tours. I think that's the big three for me. And of course, the great weather. Here's something, there are two things that people really don't know about me. Number one, when I was in college, really the only courses I took were courses about poetry. So I know as much about Victorian poetry and early 20th century poetry as I know about rock and roll. But the real deep unknown secret is that my brothers and I are three of the best body surfers in America today. And when we get together for our family reunion on the East Coast, we go to the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and we get in the ocean about one in the afternoon with matching pink bathing caps because we don't have enough hair to protect our heads from burning uh, beyond recognition and we body surf for hours until it's margarita time. So it's one of my favorite things to do in the world. It's something that I'm actually good at. I was a swimmer in high school. So catching waves and letting the wave force catch you by the hip and take you to the shore is an amazing sensation and something that people would never know about me. I'll tell you this, I was once on the Michigan side of Lake Michigan and it was windy and there were big waves and I was able to body surf on Lake Michigan once. Dig a really deep tunnel that has lots of water and uh, freeze-dried foods. Uh, no, I'm kidding, of course. Uh, for the next generation, don't take too much advice from the previous generations because they've obviously gotten it wrong.